right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the world's most exciting classroom. My name is Joe Gorowski, and I'll be your host for today. Today is our 33rd world's most exciting classroom as the Ooster Day and the Darwin 200 have been making their way around the world. Let's take a quick look at what's going on right now, where the ship is. So if I zoom out a little bit here, there we go you will see that we've just started sailing again. So we've pretty much made a complete kind of navigation around South America. Most recently, we sailed from uh, a port called Callao, uh, just outside of Lima, and we made our way to Salinas uh, in Ecuador. So let's zoom in a little bit closer here. So the Darwin 200 hasn't moved for a while. It was in port uh, and it was getting cleaned. So the ship had to be cleaned. And most importantly, the hull of the Oosterskel they needed to be cleaned. Because right now we have just set sail. We're gonna cross about a thousand kilometers of the Pacific Ocean. And we're gonna make our way to this amazing island archipelago of the Galapagos. So this is gonna be a real kind of highlight moment of the trip. We're gonna spend three weeks in this volcanic hotspot in this island archipelago and we're going to do a lot of live broadcasting for classrooms with the world's most exciting classroom while we are there but the reason why the ship had to spend so much time uh, in this area was to get its hull cleaned we don't want to bring anything to the galapagos those waters that doesn't belong there no invasive species um, so the hull had to be cleaned and certified and now you can see i believe just yesterday uh, the ustraskel they set sail from salinas and is now making its way across about a thousand kilometers of the Pacific to make its way to the Galapagos where we will be spending three weeks. So week one, we'll have Darwin leaders and we'll be on this little island here called San Cristobal. This is one of the older islands in the Galapagos. Then we'll have a week where we're gonna explore the Galapagos a little bit uh, and do some live events. And then the following week, the third week, we will be here on Santa Cruz and we will have another group of Darwin leaders joining us and taking part in various conservation projects. So while we're in the Galapagos, there will be tons and tons uh, of live content coming out. So there we go. The ship has just set sail from Ecuador, from Salinas, has about a thousand kilometers before it reaches the island archipelago of the Galapagos. And then San Cristobal will be the first destination. Uh, and that's where we'll have our first events coming from for classrooms. Now, our plan for today has changed a little bit. Uh, my friend Alejandro was supposed to join us, and he was going to talk to us about the work he does in the tropical forests uh, of Ecuador. But unfortunately, some of his travel plans fell through, and he's been delayed. Uh, so I'm going to have to reschedule him to join us in another world's most exciting classroom. And for today's event, I have kind of a little um, recap uh, of the Darwin 200 so far. So I spent some time this morning gathering some videos, some of them we haven't shared before, uh, some stories from the Darwin 200 so far. And with this being such a pivotal moment, sailing to the Galapagos, one of the marquee uh, times of the Darwin 200, I thought this could be a good time where we can go back in time uh, and look at what we've accomplished so far with the Darwin 200. Of course, the chat is open for questions. Anytime you have a question, put it into the private chat or put it into the YouTube chat and we can answer some of those questions. We've got some video clips to play. We're gonna have our Kahoot quiz as we normally will. Uh, we've got our curiosities of the week. We have a brand new experiment. So it will still be a very busy world's most exciting classroom. And we will catch up with Alejandro maybe as early uh, as next week in the world's most exciting classroom. Okay, let's get right into that action. In fact, I'm gonna keep the map up here for a little bit because part of our journey will be going back in time and part of our journey will be looking at um, where we've been, what we've accomplished, what we've seen uh, and things like that. So let's rewind. Let's go all the way back to August. In August, I was lucky enough to head to Plymouth uh, in the United Kingdom. That is where Darwin left on the voyage of the Beagle. And of course, that is where we started our journey. So we can zoom right in here on Plymouth. Now, when I got there, we had to put some satellite gear on the ship. We have a Starlink maritime unit, which lets us broadcast from the ocean while we're sailing. And then we also have a Starlink land unit. So I had to get both of those units on board and installed. Um, the first crew, uh, the first group of passengers arrived in Plymouth. And then I'm gonna share a little video here and take us back in time so we can see what it was like 
uh, when the Darwin 200, when the Ustraskalde departed from Plymouth. So let's take a little look here. Right, so August sure feels like a long time ago when the Mr. Scalde departed from Plymouth. Since then, over 10,000 nautical miles we have sailed, we've crossed the Atlantic Ocean, we've pretty much circumnavigated South America, uh, and we are now heading to the Galapagos, which will be one of the most exciting portions uh, of the entire journey. So as we continued to sail, we started to see some wildlife, which is really kind of what it's all about. So we were making our way across uh, the English Channel, heading towards France uh, and Spain. And we started to see our first wildlife. We started to see common dolphins chasing the bow of the ship. Uh, and then we had our first uh, whale sightings. Uh, so let me share one of those videos here. So this is a video of uh, some fin whales. These are the second largest whales in the world. And so this was a real test for our camera crew on board. But now, old practice for them to fly the drones from the ship. This is one of the first times that they had to fly the drone from the ship while it was sailing uh, to capture some wildlife. So this is the second largest species of whale. This is the fin whale. I think we know that the blue whale is our largest species uh, in the world. There we go, some beautiful footage. Uh, of the fin whale and one of the first uh, bits of wildlife along with some common dolphins uh, that we were able to record uh, as the Oosterskalde was beginning its sailing. So you might remember our first stop was Tenerife. That's in the Canary Islands. That is was our first stop on the journey, leg number one. And then we had our first Darwin leaders on board who worked on a variety of projects, including pilot whales, sea turtles. There were some land ones looking at plants. So we had our first Darwin leaders on board working with local conservation groups. They put together their first series of conservation videos we've been sharing kind of along the way. And then we've also had many of the Darwin leaders joining us as guests, and that's gonna continue uh, over the next few weeks. We'll have more Darwin leaders uh, come along and join us. So Tenerife was our first stop. Then we headed to Cape Verde. And there we had a special guest. We had the Natural History Museum join us and they shared with us um, Darwin's octopus. So one of the first samples Darwin collected was an octopus that he collected in Cape Verde. We got to see that specimen at the Natural History Museum where it is still uh, being preserved. It's still sometimes used by scientists. Uh, and we got to see that specimen. We also learned something really interesting about octopus in that um, they're not called tentacles, they're arms. They're called arms. So tentacles are like a squid which means all the suckers are on the end. So they're called tentacles, whereas an octopus, they're called arms because the suckers go the entire length of their arms. So keep that in mind. That might come up again in our Kahoot quiz 
uh, later in today's event. So from there, it was time to sail across the Atlantic Ocean. So a big stretch as we crossed the ocean uh, and headed to Brazil. It was amazing to cross the ocean. We have a beautiful sunset video here that I want to share. So we crossed the Atlantic Ocean and the location that we hit next was Fernando de Noronha. And that is a tiny island that's part of Brazil. So our first encounter with South America. Again, we had another big series of projects, including sea turtle projects, where we learned that there's seven species uh, of sea turtles found around the world, five of which nest uh, in Brazil, but there are seven species of sea turtles uh, in total. So Fernando was a beautiful spot to visit. And that set off several weeks of sailing along the coast of Brazil. So if I bring the map back up here, you can see that we crossed the Atlantic. Let me zoom out a little bit more. There we go. You can see we crossed the Atlantic Ocean. Here was Fernando de Noronha. And then we made landfall here in Salvador uh, in Brazil. And then we continued making our way along the coast to a location that some of you may be familiar with called Rio de Janeiro. And while we were there, we had 10 days of events. We spent time in the Atlantic rainforest. We had events at the Museum of Tomorrow and with the local community. We had Darwin leaders in the field. There was a lot going on. So what I wanna share with you today uh, is a video that we haven't shared yet. This is from one of our Darwin leaders. He was working in a place called Tijuca, National Park. So if you know Rio, uh, it is a big harbor city, but it's surrounded by forest. It's surrounded by National Park. But sometimes they call it an empty forest because although the area is protected, a lot of the wildlife was gone from the forest. Things like howler monkeys, which Charles Darwin actually shot two specimens while he was there. Uh, things like agoutis, which are a small rodent that spreads seeds along the floor. Things like tortoises, which are ecosystem engineers that work uh, in the rainforest. So a lot of these species were missing. And we met a great group called Rufana. And Joseph, who was our Darwin leader, got to spend time with them as they were preparing to release a group of howler monkeys back into Tijuca National Park. So... We're going to share the first of his videos here. I don't believe we've ever shared this one before. And we're going to see what Joe was doing and what he learned about the Howler Monkeys and Tijuca National Park. So let's get that screen sharing and let's take a look at that video together. Rio de Janeiro, one of the most iconic cities in the world. Bustling with more than 6 million people. But in the middle of it, there is a natural wonder which makes it like no other. I'm Joseph Frey, the Darwin leader from India. As part of the Darwin 200 project, I'm visiting the Rio de Janeiro. And here in the city of Rio, what I'm seeing is not the city, but beautiful forests of the Tichunga National Park. The Tijunga National Park is a neotropical rainforest that is situated in Rio de Janeiro. Once part of the Atlantic rainforest, now it has become an isolated patch due to the urban spore. 
Tijuca National Park is the smallest national park of the whole country, but uh, in contrast is the most visited one, mainly due to the Christ, the statue, but not only. And it has around 4,000 hectares. It's situated in Rio de Janeiro City and represents a real important Atlantic forest remnant for the city. This one island of forest in the middle of Rio is connected to more than 2 million people of the city. Cities create an increased heat zone around them, which we call an urban heat island. These islands of heat not only affects the lives of humans, but also changes the whole climatic structure of the area, leading to extreme climatic events. During the 18th century, Rio was faced with an extreme water shortage and the advisor of the empire decided to go for a permanent solution rather than solving it there and then. That solution was the Tichunka National Park. This part of Rio de Janeiro city from 17th to 18th century used to be coffee plantations. So what we see as forest most of it were coffee farms. So they deforestated everything. This uh, causes, of course, massive extinctions of fauna and flora. But not only this, um, this also changed the water uh, dynamics in the whole city. And this affected the water supply in the city that was below the mountain. From creating rules to prevent buildings above an elevation of 100 meters and replanting more than 300 hectares of land, they created the Tishunga National Park, which has more than 4,000 hectares of lush green forest now. So over the past uh, few years, we've come to the point in the world where over half the world's population live in an urban environments. So never has it been more important for us to bring nature to people, which is the fantastic thing about having this park on the doorstep of Rio for all the people from Rio to be able to come and visit it. Atlantic Forest biome was the most occupied biome in the whole uh, country because uh, the Portuguese started their colonization by the coast, coastal part of the country. Nowadays we have 80% uh, of the remnants has less than uh, 50 hectares. So most of them are really small and they are islands of uh, forest surrounded by um, agriculture or um, urban matrix. And this causes massive um, defaunation in those areas. So nowadays we have some forests that have no fauna inside, or at least the biggest fauna uh, is missing. If you consider the mammals, Tijuca National Park has one third uh, of the expected species that should be here if you do, don't have this island of forest. Um, this defaunation causes what we uh, know as empty forest syndrome. When we see a forest, we think about tall green spaces. Especially in a city, people go there to get away from the noises of the town. While the forest can be places of tranquility, Tishunka was missing a major part that makes a forest what it is. It was the concerted harmony of life which creates, consumes and rejuvenates each of its links. And this is when Reefona decided to make a change to the situation. They decided to recreate the links that were missing in the forest to make it from an empty one to a fully fledged celebration of life. Brazilian tapir, blue and yellow macaw, 
Red humped aguri. Yellow footed tortoise. Brown howler monkey. In the next episode, we will see how this mission is evolving and making the Tishunka National Park a thriving urban forest ecosystem. All right. So that was one of the highlight projects in Rio de Janeiro, uh, Tijuca National Park under tons of pressure, surrounded by about 11 million people in the sprawling city of Rio de Janeiro, but with that goal to bring wildlife back, to bring the macaws, the agoutis, the tortoises, the howler monkeys, to bring them back into the park, to bring that forest back to life. So as we continue sailing along, we left Brazil, we headed to Uruguay, when we got to Uruguay, we had some scientists join us on board, and they were very interested in sailing with us because we were going to pass over some seamounts. So seamounts are kind of underwater mountains where the ocean floor is pushed up and becomes very close to the surface of the ocean. Around these seamounts, there's usually lots of nutrients because the cold water currents are pushed upwards by the seamount. And then there's usually lots of life, lots of fish lots of predators like sharks around these seamounts. Now we have an ROV on board, a remotely operated vehicle. It's something we can put into the water and it's like a drone in the air, but we can use it underwater to look at what we see. So the scientists were very interested to use our ROV to look at this seamount that had never been explored before. So we were able to capture some great footage for them, some footage of um, some fish life, some coral, uh, and some other life in this area. And I have some good news to report. In the last few weeks, we found out that this area has been declared a protected, uh, marine protected area by the government. So what that means is, um, you know, thanks to some of the footage, thanks to some of the work of the scientists, they were able to prove that this area was important, that there was life, lots of life in this area, uh, and it needed to be protected. So that's not the only time we've used the ROV. When we reached Puerto Madryn uh, in uh, Argentina, we also put the ROV in the water a few times and we made some new friends. So I wanna share this really cool video clip here uh, of one of the friends we made while we were sitting at anchor in Puerto Madryn. So you can see that there's some plant life on the bottom. You can see, if you watch carefully now, you can see a few crab species. They're kind of pink colored um, and they're kind of scurrying along the bottom. There's a couple there right in the middle, right in the front. There they are. And then the ROV, it has, you can see it has lights on the front. So it's about 10 meters deep there. So about 30 feet, you can see it's got lights on the front. And then you can see that we made uh, a friend here with the ROV. We had this really curious sea lion uh, that was swimming around the boat. At some stages, it would even try to kind of almost crawl up the side of the boat. It was very curious about the people on the Ooster Scale Day. Uh, and then it was, very curious about the ROV being in the water. What was it doing? What were those bright lights all about? Um, so yeah, definitely very curious about our ROV. And you should see a lot more from our ROV uh, as we head into the South Pacific. There's lots of coral reefs uh, and areas for us to explore. So hopefully we will have a lot uh, of video from the South Pacific to share with you soon some of those coral reefs uh, and some of that biodiversity. So don't be shy, please um, use the chat sidebar if you have any questions about the project. I see a group from Virginia wants to play part two of the refauna project. I'm not gonna be able to do that today, but I can share part two with you uh, if you wanna check it out. I can even share part two and three with you uh, if your class in Virginia would like to check it out. Um, just send me a quick message after today's world's most exciting classroom uh, to remind me and I'll share those other parts with you so you can check it out. Okay, so we made our way uh, along Argentina and then we went to this beautiful remote windswept islands uh, of the Falklands. The Falklands are not visited a lot. There's only really one flight a week that comes in uh, on Saturdays and then there's military flights as well. So 
uh, UK military flights. So the, the islands are not easy to get to, but they are as beautiful as they are remote. So I want to share a little bit of the wildlife um, that our Darwin leaders and our camera folks uh, encountered in the Falklands. So we're just going to play a little bit of that video today. The elephant seals were pretty popular. Um, the males kind of control a big group of females on the beach and they keep other males from coming to join. So you saw a little bit of that fighting. When another male comes to that beach, it usually results in a fight where the stronger male uh, chases the maybe the smaller or younger male off. And then you saw those gentoo penguins who, who are a lot of fun. There's king penguins on the island. Um, I believe there's melagelenic penguins. Um, there's all kinds of bird species like petrels, tussock birds, uh, and albatross. So they are very, very busy islands, the Falkland Islands. So from there, we went to the most southern portion uh, of South America. So if I zoom out from our map a little bit here, you can see we cut through this little channel here. Uh, we made our way to Punta Arenas, where again, we had another big series uh, of projects with our Darwin leaders in Porto Williams, as well as uh, Punta Arenas. Then we also had one of our craziest live moments. We had Luca, who was a Darwin leader on board the ship, and Nico, one of the cameramen. They were out uh, in a Zodiac racing along the shore. They had one of our little satellite units wedged in the back, and we were able to broadcast live with some Peel's dolphins, also called kelp dolphins, as they were chasing the Zodiac. So let's take a look at that little clip together. Just spotted some dolphins in the distance. Let me go turn around the camera. Um, Nico's trying to try to kill them. Give me a second. Yeah. All right, there they are, there they are. Oh yeah, whoa. Oh my gosh, I can't believe we're doing this live. This is amazing. They are right under the boat. So 
So as you can see, that was a pretty special moment to be able to broadcast live to classrooms while these dolphins, those dolphins were racing with the Zodiac, swimming along with the ship. And I'm really excited for the Galapagos. I think we're gonna have an opportunity to do a lot of live broadcasting from the Galapagos, uh, hopefully with giant tortoises and green iguanas. I think it'll be really special to be able to bring that live classroom. There they are, some kelp dolphins racing and playing with the ship. From there, uh, we made our way through. Oops, there we go. We made our way through the fjords of Chile. So I'm going to back up a little bit here. You can see Chile is a very, very long country, but we sailed through these fjords uh, and eventually made our way to Peru. Now I have we haven't shared this video before. Every video or every leg, sorry, uh, of the journey the cameraman on board shoot a little video to highlight the journey and what we saw. So this is leg 11 through the fjords of Chile. I want to share that with you before we take some questions and we do our Kahoot quiz, because from there we'll pretty much be caught up uh, to where we are. So let's share one more video together uh, before we change gears for some Q&A, uh, our Kahoot quiz, and of course, uh, our latest experiment. So voyage leg 11, let's check out the fjords uh, of Chile together.
Okay, so there we go. A little taste of sailing through uh, the fjords of Chile. You saw Bruggen Glacier there. Um, of course, we encountered tons of marine mammals. Later on in that journey, we encountered blue whales and uh, say whales and humpback whales. What a beautiful spot of the world uh, to visit. So that pretty much catches us up to where we are now. I was just on the ship uh, in Peru, sailing from Callao uh, to uh, Salinas in Ecuador. And now you can see we're on our way to the Galapagos. So the Enchanted Isles, a place of marine iguanas and penguins. There are no penguins found further north than the Galapagos penguins. So right on the equator, all the other penguins are further south. Um, but you can find a small number of Galapagos penguins in the Galapagos. So with any luck, by next week, we will be in the Galapagos and we'll be doing our first live event from the Galapagos. We have 10,000 nautical miles behind us and we still have a long way to go between now and July 2025 when the Ooster Scout Day will return um, back to Falmouth in the UK. And that will be the end of this crazy epic journey that we are on. But there are lots more world's most exciting classrooms between now and then. So let's prepare for a little Kahoot quiz. I put a little Kahoot quiz together behind the scenes. While your classes are joining, I'm going to answer some of the questions that have come in via the chat. Uh, and then we'll play our Kahoot quiz together. So bear with me for a moment while I share my screen. And then let's get this Kahoot quiz going. There we go. All right. So as per usual, you need to go to kahoot.it. Um, and then it's going to ask you for a pin number, which I happen to have here nice and handy. So kahoot.it, pin number 566-8438. If you're at home, you could scan it with a device like an iPad or a tablet, that QR code, and it will bring you right in. But let's answer a few questions here. So uh, we have a classroom here. Mr. Prezeo's class is wondering how far the ship could sail before needing supplies. So the easy answer is every port that the ship goes to, uh, there'll be so some resupplies because the first thing that uh, goes on the ship is the fresh food, the fruits and the vegetables. So every port we visit, we get fresh uh, meat uh, and fruit and vegetables. Most of the legs are between a week or two. So that's not too long that the ship has to go before resupplying. However, we're eventually going to have to go from New Zealand and we're going to have to sail all the way across the Pacific Ocean around Cape Horn. So the southernmost point of South America uh, and then to the Falklands. So that's going to be well over a month and we're going to have to have all the supplies on board the ship. So as you can imagine, the fresh fruit, the vegetables are going to go pretty quickly. And then by the time over a month later that they get to the Falklands, I think the crew is really going to be wishing and hoping for some fresh fruit, some fresh vegetables. So the ship can go uh, over a month without having to get supplies. But the truth is every stop we make, every port, we like to refresh those supplies because it's really important to have fresh fruits and fresh vegetables uh, and fresh things like that. Uh, Ms. Colburn's class is wondering about a documentary or a book about the adventure, the Darwin 200. Absolutely, 100%, no question. We've already collected a pile of video from everywhere we visited, from sailing on the ocean, from all the Darwin leaders out in the field with conservation groups and their cameramen. So there will be something for sure um, that uh, comes out of this. For sure, there'll probably be some books published and no question, there'll be some kind of documentary uh, where we can highlight this journey. So another question, what happens if the ship gets broken? So there are some things like ropes and sail and things like that that could be repaired at sea. So while the ship is sailing, if if something was damaged, there are some repairs we could make at sea. But luckily, along the way, every place we're visiting has its own port, its own harbor. And in most of those places, you can get supplies for if there's some real damage done to the ship. Luckily, uh, there hasn't really been anything major happen to the ship. The Ooster Scalde is very well maintained. Um, at 
different points along the way, there are sometimes a week, two weeks, even three weeks where the ship will undergo maintenance to make sure it's running uh, and working at its best. Uh, okay, our Linwood Six has sent in some questions here. Um, what if there's no wind? That's a great question. While I was sailing to from Peru to Ecuador, we did have some times, especially at night where there was no wind. And so in that case, we take all the sails down and we do turn the engine on because the ship does have to get to the ports on time. So during the day, anytime there's wind, we have the sails up and we try to capture and use as much wind as we can. But for those times when the wind totally dies on us and we have no choice, um, we have to take the sails down uh, and turn the engine on. So during the day, the sails are usually up. At night, sometimes we do have to use uh, the motor. Okay, why don't we play our Kahoot quiz and then we'll do some more questions as well. So looks like we have a good group here ready to go. Let's get it started. So our first question in our recap of the Darwin 200, coming your way in a couple seconds. Here we go. So Tenerife is an island that's part of, so is Tenerife part of Galapagos, the Canary Islands, the Azores, or the Falkland Islands? So Tenerife, is it part of the Galapagos, the Canaries, the Azores, or the Falklands? Our first stop along the way. All right, it is part of the Canary Islands. Uh, Tenerife. Let's go to our next question here. Who's in the lead? The winged chicken is in the lead. Our next question here is a true or false. Octopus have eight tentacles. Is that true or is that false? That octopus have eight tentacles. This is a little bit tricky. We talked about this. Do octopus have eight tentacles? True or false? All right, it is false. Tentacles are what squid have. Tentacles are when there's only suckers on the end of the arm. But an octopus has suckers the entire length of their arms, so we call them arms instead of tentacles. All right, winged chicken, not letting go. Our next question coming your way. Fernando de Norona is part of which country? Is it Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, or Brazil? So it's the first place we visited after we crossed the Atlantic Ocean. But is Fernando part of Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, or Brazil? You've got a few more seconds to get your answer locked in. All right. Brazil, that is absolutely right. It was our first stop in South America in Brazil. Our next question coming your way. How many sea turtle species are there in the world? Was it two, five, seven, or nine? How many sea turtle species are there in the world? This is a question we've had so many times in our Kahoot because a lot of our Darwin Leader projects have been related to sea turtles. So we should, if you've tuned in a few times, there's a good chance you'll remember that the answer is seven. Seven species of sea turtles, five of them nest in Brazil, which we learned while we were in Fernando. All right, final question, true and false. No other species is found further north than the Galapagos penguin. So the penguins can't be found any further north than the Galapagos. Is that true or is that false? The Galapagos penguin is the furthest north species of penguin. Absolutely true, good job crew. No fooling you on that one. Hopefully we will see some Galapagos penguins live in the world's most exciting classroom. There's only a few hundred of them, so it's possible. We've got the Wonder Impala in third, the cute macaw in second, and in first place, we have the winged chicken. Did not let go of that the entire time. If you are in that classroom, make sure you send me a message uh, to, oops. This one, classroom at darwin200.com. Send me a message to classroom at darwin200.com uh, if you are in the classroom of uh, the winged chicken. All right, let's come back from that screen share. Let's do a couple more questions before we look at our experiment uh, of the week. 
So Mr. V's class is hanging out with us and they've got a great question here. Um, they are wondering if or how the animals respond to the ship in the ecosystem. And the truth is that they really seem to like it. Um, so for instance, the birds, like the blue-footed boobies, the Inca terns, um, they land on the ship all the time. And I think it's because they see the ship as a great place to take a rest. When you're out in the middle of the ocean, there's not a lot of land. A ship comes by with masts and rigging. It's a pretty convenient place to sit and relax. So the birds find it pretty interesting. The dolphins absolutely love it. Um, they race along the front. They jump in the bow wave. So uh, they find it really interesting, really exciting. Uh, and they have a heck of a lot of fun playing with it. So everything that I've witnessed being on board of the ship or seeing videos from the ship, um, it seems that the wildlife is really interested in the ship as a place of rest, as a place of curiosity. The dolphins like to play uh, around the ship. The whales, they kind of keep their distance. I don't think they're as curious. They don't swim away. Uh, so I don't think they're worried about it. But I also think that it's not as interesting or as exciting for them. The sea lions and the penguins seem interested. We've seen sea lions and penguins swimming along the side of the ship. So all in all, I think it's interesting to the sea life, especially because most of the time the engine's turned off and we're just using the sails. So the ship's a lot quieter and I think it's less intimidating uh, to the wildlife. So our Linwood grade sixes have a great question here. What was something unexpected that I saw in the rainforest? So before I got on board uh, the Ooster Day, I spent a week in the Peruvian Amazon rainforest. And I would say the most unexpected thing that I saw was a jaguar. I've always wanted to see a jaguar in the wild. And I visited places like Colombia and Costa Rica uh, and Brazil and Mexico and had no luck being out in the forest, being out exploring. And so we were on the river in a canoe and we were going down the river and a jaguar came out of the water. It had just finished swimming across the river and it came out of the water. Uh, it ran away right away when it saw us. So we stopped the canoe and we waited for a few minutes. And then sure enough, a few minutes later, it came back out onto the beach to dry off. So it was really amazing to get to see a jaguar in the Amazon rainforest is something that I'd always wanted to see. So that was definitely something unexpected because the guide I was with, he said it was very unlikely that we'd see one, but you never know. And so there we go. We got to see um, a jaguar in the rainforest. Okay, let's continue on. Let's look at last week's experiment before we look at a brand new experiment. Now, I know some classes might have to run uh, because we usually do end up running for about an hour. If you do have to leave early, you can go to the Darwin 200 YouTube page or the Exploring by the Sea of Your Pants YouTube page, and you can catch what you missed if you missed the experiment or you missed the curiosity of the week. But two weeks ago when I was on board the ship, we had my friend Kate help out. We found some really easy supplies on the ship, and we did a really quick uh, and easy experiment here together. Bosler, so I'm going to turn the volume down here, and I'm just going to talk well, about Kate this experiment. Uh, and so what we did is we took some water in a bowl, we took some dish soap, uh, and we took some pepper. And so what we did is we sprinkled the pepper on the surface uh, of the water. So a big shout out uh, to the cook on board who gave us some supplies that we could use uh, in our experiment. So we sprinkled the pepper on top uh, of the water. And after we did that, Kate put some dish soap on her finger uh, and she dipped it into uh, the pepper and we got to see what happened. Now, unfortunately, connectivity on the ship uh, can be kind of hit and miss. Uh, and we didn't see this happen fully in real time. So you see Kate's got the soap on. And then I think we had a small pause just as she dipped uh, her finger in, but we saw the results. Uh, when it unfroze, we saw that the pepper sank. We saw that the pepper had shot across to the other side uh, of the bowl. So there's a few things we need to talk about here as to what was happening. So let me pause uh, the video here and let me talk a little bit about what we saw happen here. So first of all, you saw that the pepper floated. Why did the pepper float? Well, it's less dense than water. 
So uh, anything that's less dense than water, it will float on the surface. The next thing you might have thought, well, why didn't it dissolve? We have had experiments in the past where we've put uh, baking soda in water, we put sugar in water, we put salt in water, and it always disappears. But the pepper didn't do that. It didn't dissolve. That's because pepper is hydrophobic. That's a fancy way of saying that water is not attracted to it. So because it's hydrophobic, the water doesn't dissolve it the same way as it does with something like baking soda uh, or sugar or salt. So what happened? Why did it react to the soap the way it did? So water has something called surface tension. Water molecules like to stick together. If you have time today, fill a glass with water in your classroom and then slowly keep adding drops of water. And what you'll see happen if you do it nice and slow, you'll see a dome of water form sticking out over the top of your glass. Eventually, you'll get too far and it will break the surface tension. But water molecules are really attracted to each other uh, and they tend to stick together. But when we add the soap, the soap breaks the surface tension of the water. That's why soap is such a good cleaner. It can break the surface tension of water. So we saw the pepper shoot to the sides because the water wanted to get away from the soap and it wanted to try and keep its surface tension. So that's why the pepper shot to the sides and you saw the pepper sink immediately. That's because in the center of the, of the dish, the surface tension was broken and the pepper was able to sink to the bottom. And then the water shot to the sides to try and get away from the soap and keep its surface tension. And that caused the pepper to go along with it uh, and shoot to the sides. So that was our surface tension experiment um, that we were able to do with some simple supplies that we found on board uh, of the Ooster Scalde. So we have a brand new experiment this week. We've been making crystals in various ways. So let's take a look at this week's experiment, um, making crystals, but a different kind of crystals this time. So here we go. This experiment involves growing really beautiful blue copper sulfate crystals. This is an amazing experiment. It's incredible to see the crystals grow get larger and larger. But you have to remember, copper sulfate is a poisonous chemical. I really recommend you wear eyeglasses throughout this experiment. And if you want to, wear gloves. And definitely don't let the copper sulfate solution or powder come anywhere near your eyes or your mouth or any cuts on your body, because it is technically poisonous. What you need is some copper sulfate. This comes in powder or crystal form. Your school will almost certainly have this in your laboratory some hot or boiling water. Obviously be very careful with this. You need a beaker, a funnel and some filter paper and a jar or another beaker. All right, let's get started. The first thing you need to do is put some of the copper sulfate powder into a beaker like this. I'm going to start with about four large spoonfuls. Then very, very carefully with the supervision of an adult, pour in some of the hot water. Fill the beaker to about 300 milliliters. The exact amount doesn't matter precisely. And just keep mixing the copper sulfate so it dissolves. Keep adding more and more copper sulfate until the solution is completely saturated. That means that no more copper sulfate will dissolve. You'll see it accumulate at the bottom. I think mine's still got a way to go, so I'll keep adding more and more. As you go, don't forget to keep mixing it and make sure you dissolve as much of that copper sulfate as you possibly can. I think I need a little bit more. There we go. Okay, I think my copper sulfate solution is close to saturation. I can see there's a little bit left at the bottom. I'll add one more spoonful, then I think it's about as much as it's going to dissolve in that amount of water. Yep, I think that's saturated. Okay, the next step in the process is you have to run the solution through filter paper to remove any impurities. This is actually quite important 
to enable the crystals to grow properly. So just very carefully, slowly add your solution through the filter paper in a filter funnel and you'll see beautiful transparent copper sulfate solution dripping out at the bottom. Keep an eye on your filter funnel and top up the amount of solution in the funnel to ensure that the full amount of solution is eventually filtered. And you'll end up in about half an hour with all the solution fully filtered and free of impurities. After the filtering process is done, your solution should look like this, totally transparent and see-through, and this beautiful bright blue color. You now have to leave your copper sulfate solution for about one to two days and crystals will form. Because you used hot water to dissolve the copper sulfate, a larger amount of copper sulfate could be dissolved in the hot water before the solution reached saturation point, as opposed to cold water in which a smaller amount of copper sulfate would be dissolved before the solution reached saturation. Set the solution aside and as the temperature decreases, the copper sulfate crystals will very quickly form as the solution becomes overly saturated. This normally takes about 24 to 48 hours, so check back regularly and watch those small crystals form. I've left my solution for 48 hours, and if you look really carefully, I can see crystals all the way through the bottom of the solution. It's amazing to see how many form. We need to now get one of those crystals and use it as a seed to grow one really large, beautiful crystal. So, very carefully, with the supervision of an adult, pour out the remainder of the copper sulfate solution into another beaker or jam jar, and that should reveal the crystals that have formed. Well, you can see in my one, look, there's one large mass of crystals that formed at the bottom and a few loose ones that formed in the solution itself. Very, very carefully, and remembering that this is technically a poisonous chemical, so be very careful, break up the crystals and pour them into a tray or a plate or some sort of container. For the next part of the experiment, you have to select one crystal. I can see here, look, I've got some very beautiful ones of different shapes and sizes. Try and find the one that's the most perfectly shaped. The reason why you need to select out a crystal is because we'll use these crystals as, as seeds We'll put them back into a solution of copper sulfate and we should, over the next week, form a much larger crystal that will grow around these seed ones. So by choosing the shape of your seed crystal, that will actually determine the shape of the larger crystal that we're going to grow. Let's look very carefully. Well, look, that's quite a pretty one here. I can see some rhomboid shaped ones. It really is up to you. You can choose whichever shape you'd like. I'm going to try and grow two different crystals. One, a multifaceted crystal, which you can see here, and one, a simple rhomboid shaped crystal, which we'll put over here. These are your seed crystals. We'll put these back into the solution of copper sulfate, and over the next week, they should grow much, much larger. But because of the copper sulfate solution, will be concentrated around the crystal. It'll basically just expand the shape of these crystals. Next comes a really fiddly bit of the experiment. You have to dangle your crystal into the solution. It has to be in the middle of the solution, not touching the sides, so that the crystal will grow evenly in all directions. The best way to do this is to get a pencil or a piece of wood or a bit of cardboard and tie some fishing line to it. I've used a bit of cardboard and I've cut little notches to make it grip, and this is also really good because if you rotate it, you can draw up the crystal or, or lower it down as you wish. So very carefully, and remember that the copper sulfate is poisonous, you have to make a little noose. And you might want to get an adult to help you with this, and then tie that knot around your crystal, like so. Okay, there's one. It's not easy tying them on. The crystals are very, very fragile. We'll put that to the one side, and I'll try and do the same with my rhomboid-shaped crystal. 
You're now ready to grow your crystals. Remember, the shape of your seed crystals will actually determine the shape of the crystals that are now going to grow in the solution. So very carefully place your crystal into the middle of the copper sulfate solution. Make sure that it doesn't touch any of the sides. We'll do this with both. This is the rhomboid shaped crystal. So it'll be interesting to see the differences as both crystals grow. The seed crystals act as a focal point for more and more crystal growth to develop. So the shape of your seed crystals will determine the ultimate shape of the larger crystals that's going to form in your solution. It takes about a week or so for your crystals to develop, but check back regularly and watch the progress of your crystals as they develop. Join me in two weeks' time to see the results of this experiment and to find out how these crystals have grown. You can repeat this copper sulfate crystal experiment in your school classroom with your teachers. Send in photos of your results to classroom at darwin200.com for a chance to win Amazon gift voucher prizes. Thank you for watching and good luck in growing your very own crystals. See you next time at the world's most exciting classroom. All right, there we go. Uh, an experiment you can try at home, you can try in the classroom. Two weeks to give it a go uh, and send in some pictures to classroom at darwin200.com. So two weeks to give that growing blue crystals experiment a try and to send us in some of those photos. So to wrap up for today, we have our curiosities of the week. So I'm going to share video one more time. Let's take a look at last week's curiosity uh, and then we'll see what this week's is gonna be. Oops, I think I have too many things shared in the screen right now. So let me try and do that one more time. There we go. Back everyone. Last week, I asked you to try and identify the animals that these claws belong to. If you remember carefully, I gave you a clue that one lived in the water and one lived on land. Well, let's start with this larger one. Many people guessed correctly, this is in fact the claw of a lobster. Lobsters are quite interesting because they often have different claws on each side of their body. On, in this case, the right hand claw, which is this one, is a crushing claw. If you look carefully, it has big, powerful, teeth-like appendages the lobster uses to break open clams, mussels, cockles, and other shellfish. Unfortunately, I don't have the left-hand claw of this animal. I found this one on a beach in Scotland. But the left-hand claw would be much finer, would have much smaller teeth along the length of its claw. And it uses that claw for cutting, for example, cutting up the flesh of a dead fish. So by having two totally different claws, the lobster has a toolkit for crushing on one side and cutting on the other. Well done to everyone that identified this claw correctly. Now this claw is much more difficult to identify. This is the claw of an animal that lives on land. Many people guess crabs and in a way that's sort of right. It actually belongs to an animal in the hermit crab family. It's an amazing animal called the coconut crab. Coconut crabs are the largest living terrestrial invertebrates alive today. They can be up to four kilos in weight and have a leg span nearly a meter across. I found this claw on an island in the middle of the Indian Ocean. So the crab that had this claw must have been really huge. If you look carefully, it has lots of bite marks. Coconut crabs often are cannibals. That means that they eat their own kind. And I have a feeling this crab might have ended up the dinner of another coconut crab. A few people guessed the right answers for both of these claws, so let's find out who won the Amazon gift voucher prizes. Thank you for taking part. All right, and of course we need a brand new curiosity uh, for this week, so let's load it up right now and let's see, we have one week for this one. Back everyone. For this curiosity of the week, you have to identify this object here. I'll give you a clue, it is not a type of rock. It might look a bit like a stalactite, and in a way, it's not completely unrelated to how this formed, but it is not a type of rock. It's something from a tree. Can you guess or work out what this object is? Send in your answers to classroom at darwin200.com 
for a chance to win £50 Amazon gift voucher prizes. Join us in a week's time. We'll find out the identity of this strange object in the next World's Most Exciting Classroom. Good luck and thank you for taking part. All right. So there we go. Classroom.darwin200.com. You have one week to think about what that object might be and send your answer to classroom at darwin200.com. All right, it comes to that time where we need to sign off. The Ustras Galve is on its way to the Galapagos. Uh, and so hopefully that is where we will connect from next week. Uh, until then, we have to say a huge shout out, a big thank you to our sponsors, a big thank you to our partners, without whom the world's most exciting classroom wouldn't be possible. So thank you to the classrooms who joined us today. Thank you for your great questions. Uh, and let's sign off today with that big shout out to our sponsors uh, and to our partners.